sentences. Rumors may spread that one is savagely beaten in Dakuzen, for example, giving Zen an undeservedly bad name. Therefore do not discuss your koans with anybody, not even your best friends or members of your family. It is precisely this violation of the secrecy which formerly surrounded the koan system that has brought about a steady deterioration in Rinzai teaching. What I am about to say does not apply to lay people, who are generally serious in their practice. But in the monasteries, where there are monks who resent the entire training, being there in the first place only to serve the period required to inherit the resident priesthood of a temple, this problem becomes serious. In monasteries where the discipline is faulty an older monk will often say to a younger one. What koan are you working on? When told, the older one will say. Do you understand it? No. All right, I will tell you the answer, the older monk says, and you buy me some cakes in return. An accomplished teacher can tell whether the answer is authentic or not, but if for some reason he himself becomes lukewarm, he may accept an answer which is not the monk's own. This practice may not be particularly harmful if such a monk spends only two or three years at a monastery before becoming the resident priest of a temple. As his duties there will not require his evaluating another's kensho. But it can happen that there is no opening when he completes this minimal training. So that he may remain at the monastery for perhaps eight or ten years, going through the entire koan system with answers which are not his own. Finally, as is the custom in the Rinzai sect when one completes all the koans, one receives the title of teacher. In this way one with no real understanding becomes qualified to guide others. This insidious practice is undermining Zen teaching. Soto scholars studying Zen academically justifiably attack the koan system on just these grounds. The next point concerns what questions are appropriate during Dakuzen. All questions should relate to problems growing directly out of your practice. This naturally excludes personal problems. You may feel that the privacy of Dakuzen offers an excellent opportunity for the discussion of personal or theoretical matters. But you must bear in mind that there are others waiting and that if you take up problems other than those of your practice, you are hindering them. Properly, you may ask about your stomach, for instance, if it is growling, or about your teeth hurting so that you cannot eat, or about visions you may be experiencing. You should not, however, ask about Buddhist doctrine or comparative philosophy or the difference between one sutra and another. You may ask anything so long as it arises directly out of your practice. The procedure for a new student is to make a monetary offering to the Rashi before taking Dakuzan. Why, it may be asked, all this formality. Dakuzan, it cannot be emphasized too strongly, is not a frivolous matter. While everyone is free to practice Zazen and to listen to the Rashi's commentary at Seshin. The essential character of Dakuzan is the forming of a karmic bond between teacher and disciple, the significance of which is deep in Buddhism. Dakuzan therefore is not to be taken lightly. Moreover, since what passes between the teacher and the student in Dakuzan concerns problems of a deep and ultimate nature, only the truth must be spoken between them. Very often in public meetings one hesitates to say things which might offend others, but this is not so in Dakuzan, where the absolute truth must always prevail. For these reasons the proprieties which establish this relationship are not to be slighted. It is proper to wear ceremonial dress to Dakuzan, but as this is not insisted upon nowadays you may wear anything which is presentable. When Dakuzan is announced take a position in line behind the bell outside the Zazen hall. When your turn comes and you hear my hand bell, strike the bell in front of you twice and come to this room. You should not come dashing in, as that would cause confusion and you would not be in a frame of mind to benefit from Dakuzan. Neither should you saunter in, for there are others waiting. It was the custom originally to make three prostrations at the threshold. Three in front of the teacher, and then three more at the doorway when you left, but this has now been abbreviated to three prostrations altogether, one at each of the places mentioned. In making your prostrations you should touch the tatami mat with your forehead, your hands extended in front of your head, palms upward. Then, 
bending your arms at the elbows, raise your hands, palms upward, several inches above your head. This gesture of receiving the feet, the lowliest members of the Buddha's body, symbolizes humility and the grateful acceptance into your life of the way of the Buddha. Unless you have submerged your ego, you cannot do this. Bear in mind that the Rashi is not simply a deputy of the Buddha but actually stands in his place. In making these prostrations you are in fact paying respect to the Buddha just as though he himself were sitting there, and to the Dharma. Next take a position about a foot in front of me and announce the nature of your practice. Simply say, I am counting my breaths, I am doing mu, or I am practicing shikantaza. Make any questions you have brief and to the point. Should I have anything to say to you, I will set it after you have finished. But do not come in and waste time wondering what to talk about. Remember, others are waiting to see me. My ringing of this bell is your signal to bow down and leave. After that if you should remember something, you will have to bring it up at the following decusin, because the next person will already be coming in. Shikantaza. Up to now you have been concentrating on your breaths, trying to experience vividly the inhaled breath as only inhaled breath and the exhaled breath as only exhaled breath. Next I want you to try shikantaza, which I will shortly describe in detail. It is neither usual nor desirable to change so quickly from these different exercises, but I have followed this course in order to give you a taste of the different modes of concentration. After these introductory lectures are completed and you come before me singly, I will assign you a practice corresponding to the nature of your aspiration as well as to the degree of your determination. This lecture will deal with shikantaza. Shikan means nothing but or just, while ta means to hit and zie to sit. So shikantaza is a practice in which the mind is intensely involved in just sitting. In this type of zazen it is all too easy for the mind, which is not supported by such aids in counting the breath or by a koan, to become distracted. The correct temper of mind therefore becomes doubly important. In shikantaza the mind must be unhurried yet at the same time firmly planted or massively composed, like Mount Fuji let us say. But it must also be alert, stretched, like a taut bowstring. So shikantaza is a heightened state of concentrated awareness wherein one is neither tense nor hurried, and certainly never slack. It is the mind of somebody facing death. Let us imagine that you are engaged in a duel of swordsmanship of the kind that used to take place in ancient Japan. As you face your opponent you are unceasingly watchful, set, ready. Were you to relax your vigilance even momentarily, you would be cut down instantly. A crowd gathers to see the fight. Since you are not blind you see them from the corner of your eye, and since you are not deaf you hear them. But not for an instant is your mind captured by these sense impressions. This state cannot be maintained for long. In fact, you ought not to do shikantaza for more than half an hour at a sitting. After 30 minutes get up and walk around in Kinhin and then resume your sitting. If you are truly doing shikantaza, in half an hour you will be sweating, even in winter in an unheated room, because of the heat generated by this intense concentration. When you sit for too long your mind loses its vigor, your body tires, and your efforts are less rewarding than if you had restricted your sitting to 30 minute periods. Compared with an unskilled swordsman a master uses his sword effortlessly. But this was not always the case, for there was a time when he had to strain himself to the utmost, owing to his imperfect technique, to preserve his life. It is no different with shikantaza. In the beginning tension is unavoidable, but with experience this tense zazen ripens into relaxed yet fully attentive sitting. And just as a master swordsman in an emergency unsheathes his sword effortlessly and attacks single-mindedly, just so the shikantaza adept sits without strain, alert and mindful. But do not for one minute imagine that such sitting can be achieved without long and dedicated practice. This concludes the talk on shikantaza. The Parable of Enyadatta In the last half of this lecture I will take up the tale of Enyadatta, which comes from the Ryogon Sutra. This is an exceptionally fine parable that will, if you reflect carefully upon it, clarify many abstruse points of Buddhism. 
This event is said to have occurred at the time of the Buddha. Whether it is true or legendary I cannot say. In any case, Anyadatta was a beautiful maiden who enjoyed nothing more than gazing at herself in the mirror each morning. One day when she looked into her mirror she found no head reflected there. Why not on this particular morning the sutra does not state. At any rate, the shock was so great that she became frantic, rushing around demanding to know who had taken her head. Who has my head? Where is my head? I shall die if I don't find it. She cried. Though everyone told her, don't be silly, your head is on your shoulders where it has always been, she refused to believe it. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Somebody must have taken it. She shouted, continuing her frenzied search. At length her friends, believing her mad, dragged her home and tied her to a pillar to prevent her harming herself. The being bound can be compared to undertaking Zazen. With the immobilization of the body the mind achieves a measure of tranquility. And while it is still distracted, as any Anyadatta's mind was in the belief that she had no head, yet the body is now prevented from scattering its energies. Slowly her close friends persuaded her that she had always had her head and gradually she came to half believe it. Her subconscious mind began to accept the fact that perhaps she was deluded in thinking she had lost her head. Any added as receiving the reassurance of her friends can be equated with hearing the Rashi's commentaries. Initially these are difficult to understand, but listening to them attentively, every word sinking into your subconscious, you reach the point where you begin to think. Is that really true? I wonder, yes, it must be. Suddenly one of her friends gave her a terrific clout on the head, upon which, in pain and shock, she yelled out. That's your head. There it is. Her friend exclaimed, and immediately Enyadatta saw that she had deluded herself into thinking she had lost her head when in fact she had always had it. In the same way, clouding in Zazen is of the utmost value. To be jolted physically by the Kyosaku stick or verbally by a perceptive teacher at the right time. If it is too early, it is ineffective. Can bring about self-realization. Not only is the Kyosaku valuable for spurring you on, but when you have reached a decisive stage in your Zazen a hard whack can precipitate your mind into an awareness of its true nature. In other words, enlightenment. When this happened to Enyadatta she was so elated that she rushed around exclaiming. Oh, I've got it. I have my head after all. I'm so happy. This is the rapture of Kensho. If the experience is genuine, you cannot sleep for two or three nights out of joy. Nevertheless, it is a half-mad state. To be overjoyed at finding a head you had from the very first is, to say the least, queer. Nor is it less odd to rejoice at the discovery of your essential nature, which you have never been without. The ecstasy is genuine enough, but your state of mind cannot be called natural until you have fully disabused yourself of the notion, I have become enlightened. Mark this point well, for it is often misunderstood. As her joy subsided Enyadatta recovered from her half-mad state. So it is with Satori. When your delirium of delight recedes, taking with it all thoughts of realization, you settle into a truly natural life and there is nothing queer about it. Until you reach this point, however, it is impossible to live in harmony with your environment or to continue on a course of true spiritual practice. I shall now point out more specifically the significance of the first part of the story. Since most people are indifferent to enlightenment, they are ignorant of the possibility of such an experience. They are like Enyadatta when she was unconscious of her head as such. This head, of course, corresponds to the Buddha nature, to our innate perfection. That they even have a Buddha nature never occurs to most people until they hear Shujo Anre Hotok Nari. All beings are endowed with Buddha nature from the very first. Suddenly they exclaim. Then I too must have the Buddha nature. But where is it? Thus like Enyadatta when she first missed her head and started rushing about looking for it, they commence their search for their true nature. They begin by listening to various Taisho, which seem contradictory and puzzling. 
they hear that their essential nature is no different from the Buddhas. More, that the substance of the universe is coextensive with their own Buddha nature. Yet because their minds are clouded with delusion they see themselves confronted by a world of individual entities. Once they establish firm belief in the reality of the Buddha nature, they are driven to discover it with all the force of their being. Just as Enyadatta was never without her head, so are we never separate from our essential Buddha nature whether we are enlightened or not. But of this we are unaware. We are like Enyadatta when her friends told her. Don't be absurd, you have always had your head. It is an illusion to think otherwise. The discovery of our true nature can be compared to any Adita's discovery of her head.